Good morning. Happy New Year to you guys. I hope yours started out a little bit better than mine. Mine started with a terrible cold and a very sore throat, so we'll see how we get through this morning. But uh, that's why I have my water here, so y'all forgive me when I sip on that. And hopefully I won't hack all the way through this, especially for those of you who have weak uh, reflux and gag reflexes. That would be terrible, right? Well, as always, we know, we know that we need God's help this morning, right? And so I just want to invite you to, to pray with me this morning as we begin to, to open up God's Word. Father, we're always in desperate need of your presence and your grace in our lives. And Lord, that's true this morning. God, as we come to open up your word, as we come to pray, Lord, we need your help. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to come and to, to open up our hearts, open up our eyes to see the truth of your word. Lord, that you would take your word and you would change us and transform us. Lord, we we need you to open up our hearts and our minds this morning. So, Lord, I need your help, Lord, your power working in and through me, Lord, to just communicate your truth with love and compassion and with passion, Lord. So we, we ask that you would come and be in our presence this morning. Lord, we're in desperate, desperate need of you. And, Lord, we pray all these things and always in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for praying with me this morning. We, we started last week with a series talking about his glory. And living for his glory. And we're in Psalms 115, if you remember, if you were here with us. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And we talked about how how if we would begin to understand who he is, that he's all-powerful, that he's gracious, that he's faithful to us, that he's trustworthy, that he is worthy of our praise, that as we, as we begin to understand who he is, then it gets pretty easy for us to see and why, why we should be living for his glory. And our hearts are, and our position of our hearts should be as individuals and as a church is, Lord, we don't want this life that we're living to be about us, but we want it to be about you. We want it to be about your glory. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And we ended that, that message with really beginning to understand that he's worthy, worthy, worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of the glory that's due his name for all that he's accomplished for us through his son Jesus on the cross. Amen? So we, we know that. And so this morning, when we think about living for his glory, there, there's some some adjusting that we need to do. There's some questioning that we need to have. There's, there's an, a process for you and I to be counting the cost, right? Now, we do this a lot in life. Every single day, we count the cost. We look at budgets and go, can we do this? Can we not do that, right? Uh, hopefully, you are. If you're, if you're wise, you're doing that. But what does it look like to live this life, not to us, O oh Lord, not to us? What does it cost to live this kind of life when you make a purchase when you think about retirement when you think about your budgets when you think about your family when you think about whether you're going to eat this this new year some of those new year resolutions that we have you know am I going to eat better and you're going to count the calories you're going to weigh the food some of you are going to do that I'm not more power to you you know, important decisions that we make when you're thinking about trying out for a team or to be a cheerleader, to be a football player, you count the cost. It's a possibility that I may not make that team. You know, one of the biggest calculations that you make as a man is when you think about the woman that you're going to marry or desire to marry, and you bend that knee and you ask them, will you marry me? There's a big risk there, right? Because you might not say yes. That's one of those big, big decisions. And we have to count the cost. We have to go, am I, am I willing to bend on my knee and ask this woman to marry me and take the chance? Is she worth taking the chance for her saying no to me? In my case, it's absolutely. I was pretty confident. But you know in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, it's possible. <laughs> she might go, nope, sorry. You're not the guy. That'd be terrible, right? But we count the cost. And one of the most important 
decisions that we ever make as it relates to eternity, these eternal decisions, is are we going to follow Christ or not follow him? Are we going to surrender our lives to him? Are we really going to live for his glory, for his name, for his fame, or his renown? And we need to count the cost. And even the scriptures tell us to make your calling and your election sure. Even for those of us who know Christ, who we're confident that we're in him, the Bible tells us count the cost in your life. Make sure you know, you know, you know, you know him. Make sure that you know for sure that you're actually following him. Because the call of the disciple, the call of someone who's going to live for Jesus, who desires to have eternal life, Jesus calls us to follow him. And there's a lot of cost involved in that. And we're going to look at that this morning in scriptures. I want to tell you a little bit about my friend Abraham. Abraham was a friend of mine in seminary. He was from Egypt. And being a young guy in seminary, well, not so young, but I was young. I had, had a two-year-old child. That was a long time ago because he's 26. So seminary was a long time ago. I met this guy from Egypt and began to develop a friendship with him. And I began to hear his story. Because for us, here in the States, it's, it's sometimes a difficult mindset to think about really the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. Because culturally, it's pretty well accepted that, you know, you can follow Christ or you can follow whoever you want to in the, in this, in this United States. It's an easier culture to be a believer. It's an easier culture, per se, to, to be a follower of Christ as it relates to outside forces and what they place upon us and the regulations that they were placed upon us. But when you look at my friend Abraham, here's this guy in Egypt. He's a devout Muslim. His family are devout Muslims. And he begins to, to wonder and hear about this man named Jesus who he'd never heard of, never heard the name of Jesus, but heard some conversations about this man Jesus, and he began to wonder, well, who is this Jesus? And he finally got a hold of a Bible, and he began to read the New Testament and learn about Jesus. And then Jesus comes to him in a vision and reveals himself to him that he is the Son of God, the living God, who laid down his life for him and calls Abraham to be his disciple, calls Abraham to follow him. So Abraham has to count the cost. Because if he gives his life to Christ, it's a pretty big decision in his country. And so he makes that decision. He, he gives his heart and his life to Christ. He becomes a believer. He places his faith and his trust in Jesus. And he's baptized. And as he's walking home, his family begins to understand and realize that he's become a Christian. His friends begin to understand that he's a Christian. He's met by his friends in the street, and he begins to tell them, guys, I have good news for you. I have this incredible news for you. Christ is my Savior, and they beat him half to death. Challenge him. Deny Christ. Deny Christ. Come back to your faith. And he kept saying, I can't. I can't. And so he leaves that moment to go home. He's met at the front door by his father, and his daughter, his father then beats him again asking him to deny Christ, and he refuses. Then his whole family turns their back on home. They kick him out of the house and says, you are no longer alive to us. The son that we know is now dead. And they literally have a funeral for him. So he continues on this faith journey. He continues to share the Christ. He's in prison three times for sharing the gospel. On the last time, they tell him, if we arrest you again, we're going to execute you. Because he was following Jesus. Now, that's, that's a hard thing for you and I to, to place our hearts and our minds in, in that context because we don't live in that kind of culture. We don't live in that kind of presence. But to follow Jesus means this, that we're willing and must be willing to die for his namesake. It's a call to die to follow Jesus. Difficult call. So there's some hard sayings in the New Testament that we need to be reminded of, and I want to walk through these hard sayings with you. Matthew 7.14 tells us this, Narrow is the way, 
Difficult is the way to eternal life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. It says the narrow way, there are few who find it. It's hard, it's difficult, it's costly. There are few who find their way on the path, the narrow pathway. He says there are many, many who are on the wide road that leads to destruction. It's easy, but there are many who are on it. That's a difficult, hard saying for us to understand that their Bible tells us that there are going to be few who are on the path of eternal life. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone who's sitting in church who professes to know him will enter the kingdom of God. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. And then they go on with the discussion, well, did I not do this? And did I not do this? Did I not profess in your name? Did I not... Did I not heal the sick and did I not do these things and he says look away from me for I never knew you they never knew Christ they were never a follower of Christ so make your calling and your election sure Luke 18 22 this is the story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says hey man Man, I've been, I've been watching you. I've been seeing what you're doing. I, I want to follow you. I, I want to be your disciple. And Jesus says, well, let's talk about that. He says, look, I've, I've obeyed all the laws. I've been faithful to keep all the commandments. Pretty bold statement talking to Jesus. And Jesus says, yeah, but you got this one problem. He says, sell everything that you have. He was a rich man. Sell everything that you have. Sell it all. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And the man walked away. He couldn't follow Christ. He wasn't willing to give up those riches. He wasn't willing to give up that wealth. Now, Jesus may or may not call you to sell everything, but he might. It may not be the thing that he challenges you to follow him to do, but he might. Because if Scripture makes it very clear for us, we can't love what? We can't love God and money also. You can't have two masters. You can't love one because if you're going to love one, you're going to will out begin to hate the other and we know the greatest commandment is to love the Lord God with all your heart all your mind and all your soul so we know this that the rich ring ruler really didn't obey all the commandments because he didn't love God above money Luke 6 verse 46 why do you call me Lord Lord and not do what I tell you to do that's a tough one Why do we come to this place and profess that he's Lord, that we call him Lord, and yet we do not do the very things that he demands and commands of us in his word? Jesus says, you come and you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Luke, the ninth chapter, verse 57 through 62, says, Fox that has holes but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Here again, a story of men coming going, hey, Jesus, we want to follow you. We want to be your followers. We want to be your disciples. And he says, look, the foxes, those animals out there, they have dens for homes. He says, but the Son of Man, the living God here, has nowhere to lay his head. Are you sure you want to follow me? And one says, well, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you, but I need to go back and and bury my dad, my dad, my family. Now, we don't know that his dad was already dead. His dad could be living for 10 more years. But what's Jesus' difficult saying to them? Let the dead bury the dead. Wow. That's a hard one. 
Another one said, hey, I just I want to follow you, but I, I need to go back and say farewell to my family. I need to go back and say, say bye to them before I take off and follow you. And Jesus says, hey, listen to me. If you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Those are difficult, hard sayings of Jesus. And what he's getting to, the point that he's getting at, is that it's a difficult thing to follow him. It's not as simple as we make it out to be, as praying a prayer of asking Jesus to come into our heart. And that's all we ask people to do. We don't help people to understand there's much more to this life of following Jesus than just getting your out-of-hell ticket. Obviously, that's a great benefit, right? (laughs) That I get to live in eternity forever. But when we lead people to Christ, we need to lead them understanding what it means to be a follower, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because if, if we're going to follow him, it's going to cost us. The pathway of living for his glory. Look at John, the 12th chapter with me. Verse 20. Now some of those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip who was from Bethsaida in Galilee and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. These men are coming and saying, hey, we we want to see Jesus. We want to see him. Is there any way that we can get in to see him? And Jesus' response is, is incredible. Jesus says, if you want to see the pathway to my glory, if you want to know the pathway for me, for my glory, it's I'm going to die. If you want to see me, get ready, because this is what's getting ready to happen. I'm getting ready to be died. I'm getting ready to be crucified on the cross. If you want to see my glory, look at the cross. If you want to know what it means to know my name and to know me and to worship me, look at the cross. He says, because if the wheat of of that wheat doesn't fall into the ground and dies, it'll never bear fruit. He's speaking not only of himself, but he's speaking of us as individuals, of those of us who are going to follow him. If we're not willing to die to self, we're never going to bear fruit. We're never going to be able to follow him. Because when he says, follow me, where's he going? He's heading to the cross. He's heading to lay down his life for you and for me. You want to see his glory, his death, his resurrection. If you want to understand the name above all names, if you want to begin to understand that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord, his pathway to that is death. The pathway for his glory says, if you want to see my glory, this is where I'm heading. I'm heading to the cross. How far have we wandered from this path? Somewhere along the way, amid the varying cultural tides and popular church trends, it seems that we've minimized Jesus' summon to total abandonment. Churches are filled with supposed Christians who seem content to have casual association with Christ while giving nominal adherence to Christianity. Do you hear that? That somehow, in the midst of this culture, in this church culture, that, that we are filled with people who want to be called Christians, but yet 
don't adhere themselves to Christianity. They don't adhere themselves to biblical principles and biblical living. They somehow forget the call that we are to be about making disciples. Somehow we forget to recall that we're supposed to love one another, that we're supposed to worship God, that we're supposed to love Him with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our souls. And we're to love each other with that deep passion. And that we're to be generous people. Why are we to be generous people? Because we follow Jesus, who was the most generous, who laid down His life and gave it for you and for me. That's why we tithe. Not because we're required, but because my God's generous. That's why I give to people. That's why I love people. That's why I serve people. Not because anything is in me, because my God is a giving God. But somehow we've we've missed that. Turn with me to Matthew, the 16th chapter, our main text for today. You thought you were halfway through this. Jesus is with his disciples and he says this. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? This is a pretty big claim here, pretty big statement. If you you want to be my disciples... If you want to be a follower of Jesus, this is the pathway. This is the cost of living for his glory. Disciples like Peter and Andrew and James and John and Paul show us what it looks like to follow this call. It's not just a simple invitation to prayer prayer. It's a summons to lose our lives. That's what it means to follow him, that we are summoned, that we are called to lose our lives. Now, that doesn't mean that all of us should go out and desire to be a martyr. It doesn't mean that all of us will have the opportunity to lay down our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you know what? You might. It might be where this country's heading. It might be a great refining tool for the church to find out who really, really loves him. C.S. Lewis says this. The terrible thing, the most impossible thing is to hand over your whole self, all your wishes, all your precautions to Christ. And hear what he says. Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time, so much of your money, so much of your work. I want you. I've not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or to crown it or stop it from hurting, but to have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think innocent as well as the ones that you think wicked, the whole outfit. I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. Do we understand the depth of that? Amen. That that call for us to follow him is a call to die to self. So when he says deny yourself, what he means is there's to be no rivals in your life when compared to your love for God. 
that we're going to deny those self-pleasures, those, those self-things that we, that we enjoy most, that God needs to be the thing and the person that we enjoy most. Do we understand this? The very things that he demands, the very things that he commands of us are the very things that will satisfy the deepest longing in your heart and your soul. That's what's so good about God. The things that he demands of us are the things that will satisfy us. Why is it that we always seek satisfaction in something else other than him? Because we haven't done this yet. We haven't died to self. He says, deny yourself. Now, I, I'm, I love great rivals. I had so much fun with my son this past week. He is a diehard Carolina fan. And they had a pretty bad year. And I think they got a pretty bad coach. <laughs> but here's the thing. We were watching Clemson play on TV the other day, play in Oklahoma. I had so much fun pulling for the Tigers. I'm a Carolina fan, but not like him. If you're a real Carolina fan, there's no room in your heart for Clemson. Right? And so everything in him, he wanted them to lose. The, I mean, everybody was crooked in this game. The referees were terrible. Clemson's terrible. They're not that good. I mean, it was, it was comical. And I had so much fun cheering when they would score. But what I love about my son's heart, when, it's, when he's committed, he's in. And that's the way our heart should be with God. That there's nothing in our hearts, in our lives, that would ever rival our love for him. Sometimes I'm amazed at how we come and we worship. I mean, we go to a football game right? Watching guys play football. Have you ever been in one? I mean, think about who's, what is it? Florida State, is that who we pull for here? There we go. We're seeing where those hearts are at now, right? Gators. Man, y'all had a rough night. Miami fans. Oh, a couple of them. All right. Any of you Big Ten fans in here? Rough week for y'all. <laughs> but here's the thing, if, you, if you've ever been in one of those games, and I've been in those stadiums, right, and it's like there's only a few seconds left on the clock, you've got a 50-yard field goal to make, and if you make it, you win, you beat your team. And man, you, he lines up, and the stadium's going nuts, it's crazy, and he kicks this little ball through these things, and we go nuts. People are screaming and yelling and jumping over a football game and we come here and we sing about Jesus and we're like this I'm not saying we ought to be jumping and screaming and yelling but let me tell you something your worship should be reflected what's going on in your heart your heart out here my hands out here my voice my posture is only an amplification of what's in my heart. Do you get that? So whatever's here is amplified out here. I'm amazed that somehow we come with such lackluster worship. Nothing should ever rival my worship of God. It's okay for me to stand and scream and have fun at football games. I enjoy it. I love the game. Played it almost most of my life. Love it. But it should never, ever outdo what's in my heart for him and for his glory. So deny yourselves. Jesus would say repeatedly, in a world where everything evolves around self, because in our culture, here in America, it's protect yourself, promote yourself, preserve yourself, entertain yourself, comfort yourself, take care of yourself. Jesus would say, slay yourselves. That's what it means to deny. To deny self. Take up your cross. 
So we have no rivals. We have no refusal. Get this. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross. That does not mean, that, man, I've got to bear all this bad stuff that happens in my life. It's not what it's talking about. When Jesus says, take up your cross, he knew where he was carrying his cross. He was carrying his own method of crucifixion, his own method of death. In fact, he was heading to die. He's saying, you must die to your natural self. And that includes our personal preferences. That, can, that includes our personal convictions, our personal opinions. We've got to die to all of that stuff. I am amazed at what causes churches sometimes conflict. So I, I want to walk through just a little bit of this with you. Let's talk about just personal convictions, okay? Let me, let me, let me handle biblical convictions first. Biblical convictions such as what we believe about the Trinity, what we believe about Jesus, His humanity, His deity, the holiness of God, salvation by, by grace, total depravity of man, the authority of Scriptures, the inerrancy of Scriptures. Those are just some of the things that those aren't on the table for the discussion. Those are biblical convictions that we hold to that we never, ever let go of. We never back down from. We will never, ever back away from that Jesus is the only way of salvation. I don't care what our government says. I don't care what people say. He's the only way. We will never back off of that. Then there's biblical beliefs about creation. There's some people who have a strong belief that it's six days. Some believe it's six ages. Some people who claim to be believers believe in evolution, some process of it. These are things that we can have some disagreement on. Personal holiness and how I live that out. Our mode of baptism. Some of us believe we ought to be submerged. Some believe that you don't. Roles of women in church. The forms of government in church. The second coming of Christ. There are some people who are pre-trib, post-trib, millennial. There are some areas in there that I can have fellowship with someone, that I can agree with someone or disagree with someone and be okay and still be in unity. There's personal convictions about alcohol, about dancing, about cards, about gambling, about education, whether it should be Christian education or secular education, about language, about movies, about politics. Those are personal convictions that you have that are okay. But the problem we have is when you take your personal convictions and you elevate them to the level of Scripture. That's what our brothers in the Catholic Church do. They have the Scriptures and they have their tradition. And they're on the same playing field. And what's even scarier than that is sometimes we take our personal preferences and we line them up right there with Scripture. And personal preference could be such as whether I like Ford or Chevy. Right? Whether I like two-ply or one-ply toilet paper. That's a preference. Or the flavor of ice cream. Or whether I like dogs or cats. I don't really like either. Or what style of worship music do we play? It's personal preference. I have mine, you have yours, but may I never, ever place my preference above yours because the Bible tells me what? That I'm to seek my brother's need first. All that stuff needs to be put in context of where you are. I am amazed, amazed at the, the arguments that churches have, the difficulties that churches have sometimes over preferences and has never, ever have to do anything with biblical convictions. We are, we do not have a right to say no to God. Whatever He asks, whatever He requires, you do not have a right to say no. We're to die to that stuff. I'm to die to my own personal preference. You know, my inability to worship to a certain style of music says more about me as a believer than it ever will about the style of music. 
Because listen, I've been to 17 different countries. I've worshipped some really worship, weird worship stuff. But if you really want to see heartfelt worship, you go down to Haiti. To a country that's really too close to ignore, right? But we do. And let me take you to City Soleil. And let me take you to churches in the heart of City Soleil. Now, City Soleil is the poorest city in Haiti. It's the most dangerous city in Haiti. It's four square miles. No water, no sewage, no electricity. It looks like a war zone. And everywhere you look, there are children who are starving. Children's hair are turning orange because they're malnourished. There's naked kids running everywhere. There's poverty. There's sewage in the street. There's trash burning everywhere. It is a terrible, hard, difficult place. But then you show up at their worship service. Oh, my. I'll never forget the opportunity I had to preach in that church. And I said, hey, I want you guys to pray with me. Everybody's standing I hit my knees, and the next thing I hear over the audience is whoosh. I'm like, what was that? Because there's 2,000 people. Every one of them hit their knees. And then they begin to pray, and it's, it's on fire. You can feel the presence of God like nothing else I've ever experienced. And then they get up, and they begin to sing, and they begin to worship. And it's, I have no idea what they're saying, but, man, it's there. The presence and the power of God is moving. And this is what the tall tale sign is. They start to take up the offering. These are people who have nothing. They don't know if they have food to eat at home. And they're reaching it in their pockets and they're giving not out of their plenty, but out of their deep need. That's when you're giving. When you're giving and it hurts Mm-hmm. I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh my goodness. This is worship. This is real worship. Because they, they know what it means to follow him. They're going to be obedient even if it hurts. Because they don't have a right to say no to him. We do not have a right to say no to him to God. He can ask of anything of us, and we say yes. That means he might ask you to sell everything you have. That's right, he might, and you must say yes. It might mean that you have to leave this country and go live somewhere else and be on the mission field. Yes, that might be the answer, yes. He might call you to stop doing what you're doing where you're working at and do something different. Yes, he might do that. He may not. We do not have a right to say no. He's God. When he says to love one another, when you think about all the love one another, that you're to pray for one another, you're to love one another, you're to care for one another, we don't have a right to say no. We don't have a right to say, well, I'm upset with that person, I'm not going to pray for them. I'm upset with that person, I, I'm not going to love them. We don't have that option. When Jesus says that you're to share your faith, it's not an option. When Jesus says that our hearts should and our lives should be about making disciples, teaching people to understand and how to follow God's word, it's not an option. It's not. But we live as if it is. Take up your cross. There's no refusal. And he says, follow me. There's no retreat. Whoever puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. When we surrender, when we say yes, there's, there's no looking back, there's no retreating, there's no taking a vacation, there's no taking time off, there's no thing such as retirement in God's kingdom. You and I will never, ever stop loving him. You and I will never, ever stop being obedient. You and I will never, ever stop being on mission until he calls us home. 
So for those of you who have served the church for a long time and you think it's time for now for you to sit on the sidelines and rest, sorry, you don't get to do that. Man, we love you. Keep serving. Keep loving. Keep setting that example for the younger generation. Younger generation, it's time to get busy. It's time to start serving. It's time to start loving. He says, follow me. There's no retreat. Listen, I'm, I'm convinced that when we take serious the look at what Jesus really meant when he said, follow me, and that we will discover that there is far more pleasure to be experienced in him, indescribably greater power to be realized with him, and a much higher purpose to be accomplished for him than anything else in the world has to offer. And as a result, we will all, every single Christian, eagerly, willingly, gladly lose our lives to know and proclaim Christ. For this is simply what it means to follow him. Are we following him? And that may not have been the New Year's sermon you were thinking about. Jesus doesn't want a better you. You can hear that fake, false teaching all over the place. Jesus has never, ever called you to be a better you. He's called you to die. So that he can live in you. That's what Paul says. It's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. This life I live, I live for the glory and through the power of Christ who lives in me. Now will you follow him? Have you decided in your heart to follow him? Because that's his call. If you're here today and you, you don't know him, you're not in a relationship with God, you've been thinking about it, you've been praying about it, you've been talking to God about, God, can I trust you? Let me tell you something. This is what it means to follow him. Is that you lay down everything. You forsake everything for him, for his glory, for his renown, for his fame, and live a life that's not about you, but about his glory, his fame, and his renown. That's his call, to follow him. So as a church, as his people, together, are we going to follow him? Are we going to start denying ourselves? Are we going to start taking up his cross? And are we going to follow him as God's people, as his body, and do that for his glory? Amen. Because that's what he's called us to. That's what he's called this church to. Because you know what happens when we start following him? When you really start following him, you know what happens? You begin to look more and more and more like him. And when the church starts following him, we begin to look more and more like the one we're following. And when you and I begin to look more and more like him, the world starts looking at us and going, oh my gosh, what's going on there? What's happening there? I got to know what they have. I got to know what they're doing. I got to be a part of what's happening. And God starts calling people by the hundreds and the thousands to come to him. That's what he does. He's the one who grows his church. Not me, not you, he does. And he does that when his people start being faithful. Faithful to follow him. And where was he heading? <laughs> he says, the pathway to my glory is the cross. And we've got to follow. So as you stand with me as we sing this hymn, as you worship, and as you, I pray that this song is a prayer for you that you've decided to follow him. If you haven't, that it would be your prayer. Lord, will you, will you help me to follow you? This altar is open for prayer. I'm offered. I'm here if you want to, to have prayer with me. You guys come.